Okay, I'd like to I'd like to thank um, again the True Bug Tuesday committee for allowing me to talk about um, a little bit of research I've started dabbling into now over the last couple of years, um, which I accidentally kind of got into. Uh, but this work is also being done with Michael Schwartz. Um, he's helping me a lot with the fact that um, some of the new stuff we found are murines, which is a completely different. I mean, it's not completely different, but a new group for me. So I'm appreciating his expertise and his input on this interesting group of insects. Okay, so um, in this picture here, you can see, can everybody see my mouse kind of? Okay, these are the Davis Mountains in Texas. And so these are the second highest, mount, second highest mountain range in Texas. The tallest are the Guadalupe Mountains, which are right on the border of New Mexico. These are farther south. Um, in case you are not sure where Texas is, um, it's one of the largest states in the United States. It's right on the border with Mexico. Um, the county that uh, the Davis Mountains are in are in Jeff Davis County, which is this red triangle right here. Um, and then the mountain range where the preserve is this star. So it's essentially right in the middle of this county in Texas. Um, Taking a look at the state here, you can see that there's a lot of different um, geographical features. So there's definitely more higher elevation areas. So this is the Edwards Plateau. Um, right down here, the Davis Mountains, the Guadalupe Mountains are up in here. So as you go farther west, the elevation rate uh, is much higher. Um, again, here's the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's about 10 different eco regions. So Texas is very diverse um, on top of being big. I mean, everything's bigger in Texas. But um, Mount Livermore, which is right around exactly here on the star, is about 2,554 meters. So it's it's pretty pretty high elevation. And so the area that I've been doing research in is this Davis Mountains Preserve, which on the left hand side, I know this is kind of an ambiguous map. Um, what's important is this green area here. This is property bought by the Nature Conservancy. And um, the green area is their technical property that they own. Um, and the section right about here, again, is Mount Livermore, the highest peak. Um, these other areas here that are blue are easements. So property that's okay. maintained for the preserve, um, but not te technically own, owned. Um, so this project that I was invited on focuses on the Southern section here, um, mainly because this is very geographically challenging to get to. Um, another noteworthy location is this McDonald's Observatory where they do um, astrological work. Um, and then another section I'm gonna be talking about kind of distantly is the Marquoise property. So there's uh, this whole area here is a development um, for housing. And there was a coleopterist who for at least 20 to 30 years would allow entomologists on his property to do light trapping. And he was a coleopterist um, named David Marquois. So a lot of Texas A&M colleagues have collected specimens around there. It's technically not part of the preserve, but it's part of the county and part of the same mountain range. So um, when I talk about Davis specimens, I may be talking about some of these specimens as well. What's interesting about the mountains is the fact that it's kind of this conglomeration of all these different um, eco regions and what are considered sort of elements of biodiversity. Um, these two figures are actually from a paper from 2017 by Keeling, who did this botanical study of, again, the same southern region of the Nature Conservancy. And he found that in terms of plant fauna, you get all these different elements combined. Um, the ends of the lines here are where this epicenters of this biodiversity of these elements are. So you could see, I mean, we're talking about at least seven different elements kind of convening right into this mountain range. So you get all kinds of plants. This would either be their most Eastern range or sometimes even the most Western range of some of these Comanchean elements. And this paper was really helpful for the plants because um, I'm not a botanist, but it was helpful to figure out for the host plants based on this paper. 
Um, what's again nice about this mountain range, which is uh, unique for Texas, is it actually has a relictual standing of ponderosa pine. Um, and it has a bunch of endemic pines and different um, species of oaks that you can only find here, and especially at the higher elevations. Um, when you get to the lower elevations, it gets extremely hot, extremely dry, more desert environment. But as you get, you know, as you climb, you start to get these sort of niche environments that you can't have anywhere else. There's a few springs. I think Toby Springs is somewhere around in this picture. Um, but you also get a significant amount of rainfall that you don't get anywhere else in the surrounding environment. So you get this, again, sort of sky island effect that you would see more in New Mexico and Arizona of unique, um, you know, animals and insects and plants that live at these high mountaintops here. Um, and another thing to mention too, again, um, down in this area, Seasons are important, but actually not as much as the rainy season. So what we typically think for the rest of the state, you know, you'd want to go collecting in the spring and the fall. Um, here, it's more dependent on rain and the rainy season, which is actually mostly in um, July. So uh, the rest of the year, and especially sometimes in the fall too, you get these rains. And that's what really triggers a lot of the blooming and the um, floristic characteristics of this mountain range. Um, for the mirrored nerds in the discussion, <laughs> um, there's also quite a lot of endemic oaks that are only really found in this mountain region for Texas. Um, on the right, so you've got like the gray oaks, the emery oaks. Um, what's interesting is there's only um, one location for this Mexican oak and uh, it's here in bold and it's only at the top of the mountain, Mount Livermore. So, um, for me, it was interesting because I know for the PBI, um, one of the focus groups for a lot of the research in the Southwestern region was all the endemic fauna on these oaks. And so I was really curious to see what kind of stuff would be here, um, especially since there's all this known diversity. Um, and how did I get into this project? <laughs> Um, so where I did my master's and PhD at Texas A&M, um, they have this long history of this thing called the Ento Blitz, which is a biodiversity blitz, but only for bug nerds. So we mainly worked on insects and it allowed me as I was going through grad school to meet other entomologists in the state, not only, you know, professionals, but also amateurs. And one of the people I met over the years was this gentleman, Ashley Schmitz, who's a coleopterist. And he had been doing work all over Texas collecting beetles. And in 2020, I think he approached the Nature Conservancy to do this biodiversity fauna of the Davis Mountains because there really hadn't been an intensive study of the arthropod fauna. And so he knew I was from Texas and he knew I did myriads. And so he started sending me pictures of stuff. He's like, what is this? What is this? And so eventually I kept telling him, you know, for myriads, you kind of have to dissect them. So he started sending me specimens to identify for his list. And one of the things I found was a lot of the, a lot of it I could identify to some degree, but there was a lot of, I was finding that I couldn't. So um, in particular, there's one series of bugs, which I'm going to follow up on in a second that I'd never seen before. And, um, and unfortunately there are only two specimens. So um, I also started to approach him about doing field work to collect more bugs because he's a coleopterist and um, there were a few um, niche issues that we ran into with some of these specimens. All right, so through the progress of this two year kind of involvement, I'm gonna focus on two stories. One is this new species of Nidomeris. Um, well, that's where we think it is now. Um, and then the second is this, these new species of Phytocharis that I found um, both either through collecting or by accident through Texas A&M's collection, trying to get more of the other two new species. So um, starting on the first one, um, like I mentioned, Ashley, with the goodness of his heart, <laughs> collected stuff in ethanol, thinking it was the greatest way to you know, collect and send stuff. But as many of you know, who work with mirrors, that's not what you do um, because they lose their legs, they lose their color and they just shrivel and lose all kinds of stuff. So um, he sent me these two specimens and 
despite, you know, having one leg maybe left, um, I realized these were weird because I'd never seen a myriad with these weird spots on the pronotum before. So that had these two little spots here and these spots here. And it had one leg enough that I knew it was a mirror and I just dissected it, but I had no clue what it was. Um, on the label, it said sweeping. And on this Livermore Vista trail, which is six miles long. So I didn't know where on the trail he collected it. And I didn't know what he was sweeping that he found it on, but he at least found two specimens. So I was like, okay, well, you know, it's something. And I sent pictures to Tom Henry and Michael Schwartz. And I was like, uh, do you know what it is? I don't know what it is. Um, and Michael wrote back to me saying, you know, wait, this is maybe something part of my oak bug study that I'm doing. And um, which we're gonna talk a little bit more in a minute. So get more. <laughs> and so um, the following year, I went in May to um, try and collect at the same time and generally the same area that Ashley did, you know, collecting as a myridologist where I didn't put him in ethanol. And I ended up, you know, finding more specimens. And, you know, Michael said, go ahead and check the oaks because it might be part of my oak bugs. So I hit all these different oak trees, including Quercus grissia. And I found at least maybe 10 specimens. Um, what's interesting, and I know this isn't a great photo, this is a picture I took why I was there in the Davis Mounts and sent it to Michael being like, is this it? Is this it? Please. Um, the males here have actually more of a reddish coloration to them. The females are more green, which unfortunately they lost a lot of their color while they were um, since then. But I did find some, so I was really excited. Um, what well, was frustrating, it was a severe drought out there and that's actually not that unusual now with climate change, um, but surprisingly the oaks were still blooming despite this drought. So another important thing is uh, the oak bloom, which happens sometimes, you know, April, March. So a lot of stuff was dependent and feeding on the actual oak panicles, including these guys here were feeding on that. And so I got even better specimens um, and they're found on this guy, the, the gray oak. Um, they're again, kind of have a spotted pattern on the pronotum, which is interesting. Um, and then we also looked at the male and the female genitalia to see what other kind of characters we can find to try and figure out where they go in the Mirini. And that's where we sort of got into a little bit of a quandary. So I went to go visit Michael in Canada um, a couple of weekends ago because I think we hopped between three different genera that it could be. Um, the one that we think it's most likely part of is this guy, Nidomeris distinctus. Um, sorry, it's, um, yeah, distinctus knight based on the genitalia, but you could tell there's a very different coloration. Um, distinctus is a the only species in this genus, and it is found on various Quercus species. So we're in the right ballpark. But Michael's like, but, but, but there's more. Because there's this guy, there's Neoborops vigilax, which also feeds on oaks. Again, has this beige kind of red patterning, similar genitalia, um, same sort of shiny surface. And um, it has an overlapping distribution for the most part as well as the new species we found and also Nidomeris distinctus. But wait, there's more. There's this guy too. Um, like of course, Dariacori, eh, I can't say that right, Dariacoroides, which again also feeds on Quercus grissia. Um, again, similar distribution pattern, similar overall aesthetic, um, genitalia similar. Um, there is, again, this interesting female genitalia character that we found, which seems to be consistent with Nidomeris, but we still are kind of looking into some of these other taxa to see if there's some similar gen uh, genitalic characters. Um, but essentially what we found was opening a can of worms. Um, <laughs> our spotted bug is part of this lineage of taxa, most likely. Um, right now, again, Nidomeris is our best bet. However, you know, it looks like there's a lot of other taxa and other genera that are probably closely related, but um, it looks like we're going to probably have to do a phylogenetic analysis to either figure out if that's exactly where it goes, but also, you know, what's the resolution of these other taxa. Um, and this gives me an excuse to get back into DNA. Yay! 
but um, we're gonna probably have to look at more sampling and again, continue to look at the diversity to see um, you know, what we should include, what we shouldn't include and what it means for revising this interesting group. But nonetheless, it's probably a new species. So, um, but there was more other goodies. Um, <laughs> so while I was there, I would be, you know, a bad entomologist if I wasn't collecting other stuff. So uh, while I was there, I found other grass feeding uh, myriads, um, some largids, some, well, Ashley found those guys, the creids. Um, but I also found a whole bunch of Phytophorus. Oh, by the way, here's um, Larinoceros personatus. Look at their titties. They're so cute. Um, <laughs> I found a lot of Phytophorus, which, um, so for example, here's um, Olsenai, here's Rosa Pennies. Um, I, again, my, my goal for this grant or this project is to identify as much as I can for Ashley. And unfortunately that meant a lot of Phytophorus. Um, and again, I really didn't really want to work with it, but you know, I had to do it. I wanted to get names for them. Um, the reason Phytophthora is so challenging is there's at least 700 species described in the genus. So it's one of the most diverse genera of mirrors out there, um, mainly Holarctic. Um, for West Texas, um, Gary Stonall did a really nice paper of Western Phytophthora in 1988. And he covered quite a lot of what I actually was able to find. Um, he found about 53 species in this section of southeastern New Mexico and West Texas. So this is kind of a hot spot for diversity. Um, and then he also added another 11 species just from Texas alone in a following up paper in 1995. Um, based on the literature of what I could find, there's about 18 species currently known from the county alone. Um, and I found about four new, um, mostly from new species from oak. So when you specifically hit the oak trees, you actually find some interesting taxa. Um, two were found, I, two were ones I found, and then two were ones that I found through Texas A&M material. Um, and again, a part of the nice thing about coming up to Canada this past weekend is Gary Stondahl left a synaptic collection of his Phytochrist material with um, Michael Schwartz of the CNC. So I was actually able to re reference it when I was looking at all these taxa to make sure it was on the right track. Um, so most of what I was able to kind of sample was a juniper pinion oak environment. So um, this is the MacGyver Center, which is their sort of head bait, you know, main base for the Nature Conservancy. This uh, gray oak right here is actually where I found the holotype of one of the new species. So it wasn't very hard to find something new <laughs> um, for MacGyver, I named after the MacGyver Center. Um, but part of the other reason I had to sort of stick to the lower elevation in this environment is because when you're driving to the Nature Conservancy with a rental car, you can't drive it up a mountain to do <laughs> field work at the higher elevation. So I unfortunately never really got to go to the higher stuff because I can't off-road with a little Chevy car. I try, but I, my insurance would hate me. Um, so some of the new stuff we found, well, maybe not new, these are actually recorded for the county, but um, one of the things that we're gonna do with the paper coming out is we're actually gonna document the habitus photos of a lot of these taxa because uh, Gary in his 1990, 1988 paper in 1995 did a really great job of illustrating all the genitalia, but there's no dorsal habitus images of most of these taxa. So we're at least gonna show what these things look like. Um, I found this guy sweeping along the trails, actually female, sorry, one female, um, at the lower elevation. It was on Artemisia, um, Phytophthora seminotatus. Um, here's Rosa Pennis. It's actually a little pinker than the photograph came out. Um, these were found a lot with autumn, autumn nomiris, uh, sweeping the grasses right around the MacGyver Center. Um, these are three of the new species, all brown. <laughs> um, brown and kind of cryptic. Um, this is uh, Phytophthora schmitzi, which is named after Ashley, who invited me on the project. Um, whoops, let me go back. Eek. Why can't I go back? Escape. No, okay. Anyway, all right. Sorry about that. Um, so this I found on Quercus grisia which is again, not too far outside the MacGyver Center. 
Um, I also found this on Corcus Grisia. This is the one from that tree behind the um, conservation center. And what's interesting about this one is the shine. So that kind of easily places it in one of Gary Stonedahl's group. Um, the I think it's the Juncius group. So that's one of the characteristics. Um, Schmitzi is part of the Rostratus group. So Gary created about 22 species groups. So it makes it a little bit easier to kind of fit them in a context, but it's still kind of cryptic. Um, when I was looking for more samples of these, because I only had a couple of specimens, I asked Texas A&M for their undetermined material from Jeff Davis County. And while looking for these, I found him. So this is from Phytocris Marquas. This is from the Marqua property that I mentioned earlier on the other side of the mountains. Um, this is another new species. Uh, it was collected from lights. Um, so a lot of the material from there is actually collected on lights because the people who collected there were coleopters as well. And so they never really, they didn't really beat plants or look for specific host plants. Um, so the other really pretty ones that I found um, is P, whoops, here we go, back, P. Olsenai. Oops. Um, these guys were found on Corcus emery, Seminotatus, which was known to be around there on Pinus sembroides. P. juniperus, this is one of the A&M specimens. It was found at lights over in, um, Davis Marquois property. This is another new species from um, David Marquois property on the other side of the mountain. This one's actually also fairly pretty if you get a chance to see it. It's got these yellow bands here. Um, we're not sure what it feeds on because we only found, or it was again collected at lights and we only found males. So it might be a Brachyptus female, maybe a grass feeder, who knows. Pinus cenarius. Phytocris or Phytocris varius, Phytocris scenarius. Again, only found on lights because uh, there's no host records yet. P. Vanduzii. Um, we found one state record, um, Phytocris seminotatus, also collected from lights. Um, so that's new. All the other uh, representatives are from Arizona and New Mexico. So that was kind of interesting. And then we found one new host record, um, P. Babaquivari, which is found on juniper, as well as lights. And then our last two spe spe species that we found for the county are uh, P. Carnosis, which, which is actually fairly distributed in the area. Um, so it's not so much of a surprise to find it. Again, there hadn't been a habitus photo of this or illustration. So when the <laughs> diagnosis says, pink lake tinge. It's hard to really tell what that means, but you can kind of see it here on the end of the cuneus. Um, and then lastly, we found, again, another fairly widely distributed one, uh, Pilophorus decurvatus, which I found on Quercus gambelli, and also, again, coming to lights. Um, so in general, there's a lot of diversity. Um, unfortunately, again, most are collected from lights because that's just the people who sampled there, they just ran light sheets every night and they got some really cool diversity, but we don't know what they were found on. So um, I missed about six known species for the county, which, whoops, again, I'm not surprised because I didn't get to get up there. So I think if I had a chance to check some of these higher elevation sites, I probably would have found some of these other guys. Um, it's still good to at least confirm what the host species are for a lot of these. Um, again, it's not known. And I also want to try going in October because ironically, a lot of these Phytocorus species seem to have a second generation in October, um, which you would think be, would be weird. But um, again, maybe it has to do with the rains. Um, but yeah, October, November, you could still sample down there. Kind of just a, for the non mirani people, here's some other cool stuff I found. Um, I found Tubiacris notata on Devil's Claw. This is a weird little prostate plant that um, it's called Devil's Claw because of the seeds. Apparently, if it gets hooked on your boot, it's a really pain, you know, quite a pain to get off. Um, and those are its seeds. That's how it distributes. Um, I found this undescribed species of Parthenicus on Apache plume. So. This is a really pretty bush, um, it's a rosid. Um, the, the bug also has these really pretty um, pink spots on it. Um, I'm passing these specimens along to Tom Henry because I, I think he's gotten a series that he was wanting to publish on. But in general, um, this is a list of, 
again, what I found at the conservations, well, I didn't find it. I identified from the conservation area. Um, I want to thank a lot of you guys for helping me with some of these because I'm, you know, not an expert on, for example, we've got some pentatomids in here. Um, and I know I've tapped into Christian for some of the regivids, but um, it's not a bad list. It's a start. And I know there's stuff in here, for example, that's SP that may in fact be something different. Um, Pamelia, I know, for example, um, Tom said there's at least four species there, but um, that's his group. I'm, and there might be something new in there. I'm not messing with it. So it's a start. Um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it there because some cool names there. Um, lots more to do. I think there's about a year left in the project. Um, there's still stuff I haven't gotten or can't do. Um, so some of the radids, Ernst, I see you in the <laughs> in the community there. Um, some nabids, some aquatics. Um, the aquatics have the potential of something interesting because again, a lot of the water is ephemeral. Um, we're dependent on the rainy season. So there might be something from, you know, branching in from Mexico that comes as far north. Who knows? Um, that's just something I'm not as versed in. I'm gonna try and get to the higher elevations. Um, if I can, hopefully it's about six mile hike. So I'm hoping I can find a car. Um, and also get more host plant records. So at least, you know, if if it's not new, at least we can know what it's on. And especially as climate change is occurring and we know, for example, the ponderosa pines are starting to die in some of these environments, um, especially the Davis Mountains. If we know what's disappearing as host plants, we can anticipate that also means that the insects are also disappearing. So that's an important ecological thing that lots of information that we are potentially having. Um, I want to thank, you know, Christian, Stephanie, and Tatiana for the True Bug Tuesdays for doing this and allowing me to talk about bugs again. Yay! Ashley for inviting me onto the uh, biodiversity survey that he's a part of. It's been fun to kind of work down there again. Um, and again, all my colleagues for helping me identify Heteroptera that I don't know because it's a super diverse group. That's why we love it. Um, but you can't know everything about everything. So um, thank you. And um, Michael, is there anything you wanted to add real quick or? Uh, I, I do, you have to turn off your, sorry. Stop share.